Hi, I'm Brad Rex, the former vice president for Disney's Epcot theme park, and you're listening to the Coaster Challenge podcast. Hi there, I'm Lee Cockrell. I'm the former executive vice president of Walt Disney World, and Mickey Mouse was my boss. And you're listening to the Coaster Challenge podcast. Do you accept the Coaster Challenge? Yes, I accept the Coaster Challenge. Do you accept the Coaster Challenge? Coaster Challenge Podcast is here. It's time to face your fears. Get that theme park therapy and let us both through. Coaster Challenge Podcast is here. Your fear can disappear. We know that theme park therapy can dry up all your tears. Do you accept the Coaster Challenge? Yes, I accept the Coaster Challenge. Do you accept the Coaster Challenge? We accept because you know we're not average. You're listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. A journey where people become fearful to fearless, all from riding roller coasters. So please, secure your hats and glasses, and keep your hands and arms inside the podcast. It's time to accept the coaster challenge with your hosts, Kim Dykes. Good evening, everyone. This is Kim, one of the producers of the newly expanded Coaster Challenge Network, and I'm honored to welcome a special VIP guest this evening. Today, I have the honor of speaking with our second guest from the Six Flags Park. I'm excited to welcome Josh Parisher, coaster enthusiast and director of operations at Six Flags Fiesta, Texas. Thank you for joining us and welcome, Josh. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm so excited to finally get to sit down and speak with you. I know we've been playing Facebook tag for a while, and um, I know you have a very busy schedule, so thank you for taking the time to sit down and talk with me this evening. This is our first time talking to each other in person. I know about the role you currently have at Six Flags Fiesta Texas, and we've become somewhat affiliated on social media. With so many amazing changes happening at Six Flags Fiesta Texas, I know it takes amazing people to make it happen. I'm so excited to learn more about you. Will you please share a few things about yourself with our audience to get us started? Definitely. My name is Joshua Parisher. As you shared, I I work at Six Flags PS Texas in the Director of Operations role. Uh, For me, getting started in the roller coaster community uh, was at a young age. Uh, My father and my mother took me to Kitty Park in San Antonio, where I rode my first roller coaster at four years old. Kind of took hold from that point. Um, jumped into working in theme parks when I was 16. Um, I've spent the last 24 and a half years working for Six Flags and Landry's. Um, I've currently rode, well, isn't an extreme amount. I've rode 300, about 300 roller coasters um, in my lifetime. Um, I spend my free time traveling and visiting amusement parks with my girlfriend, Chelsea, and, and my son, Landon. Um, and I enjoy watching theme park and coach review videos on YouTube. Um, these are how we spend our, our evenings, you know, especially when I get off work or days off. Um, being enthusiasts and watching videos and, and planning our next trips. To me, that just sounds like the dream life. <laughs> being able to combine your hobby with working in a park feeling like you never work a day in your life (laughs) sounds absolutely incredible. So the first part of our interview is going to be what we basically refer to here on the podcast is the fear journey. We're going to take a walk back through your history of coasters and amusement parks, you know, back all the way back to where it all began. And then the second half of the interview We're going to exit the fear time traveler, which I like to refer to it as. And we're going to really talk about you, the person you are today, and things you look forward to in the future. So if you're ready, I'm going to go ahead and move forward with our first question. I'm ready. All right. So I heard you earlier in your introduction mention that first coaster you rode. Would you please tell us more about that one, your very first roller coaster? 
my first roller coaster was uh, Crystal Little Dipper at Kitty Park in San Antonio. Okay, and what do you really remember about that ride? I, I was young then. I, I I have a lot of pictures that my parents took that um, I have in albums of you know me riding all the you know small carnival like rides that they have um, located around that facility. Um, I was very young back then. Um, yeah, but you know I, I, that's really where it started for me because um, it's very small. I want to call it a portable roller coaster. It's a very tiny little roller coaster. Yeah, uh, riding that with my mom. I'm one of those crazy enthusiasts that will still go and ride the portable roller coasters. If when we're on our road trips, we find these random credits. We always we'll always take a day and do what we refer to as credit chasing. And um, some of the coasters I've ridden have definitely been more interesting than others. I'll say that uh, my count is currently at 365. And it wouldn't be <laughs> anywhere near that high if it weren't for some of those little portable coaster credits that pop up here, there, and everywhere. Carnivals, rodeos, you name it. Oh, yeah. The last one was actually, we went over Labor Day weekend to Illinois. And the night before we left, I got this random message from a friend and said, hey, there's a fair in that area. I got the name of the fair and looked it up. It was quite literally 10 minutes from my hotel. And they had a wacky worm. So <laughs> and they had a wacky worm dragon wagon. So we had to go over there and do that on the way out of town before coming back home. And that's just the kind of random luck I have everywhere I go. I always say I know all the places we're going in advance, but then it always becomes a case of, oh, yes, there's more. <laughs> Kelsey's constantly looking up where those one, that one off coaster, or we're on a road trip, mm -hmm. pointing at a fair that's off on the side of the road, and she sees, yes, pull over, pull over, credit. Great minds think alike, apparently. I'll have to tell you a story later. I'll, I'll save it about that trip to Illinois and another one of those semi portable coasters. I'll leave it at that for now. That was one of the more interesting ones. So, you know, part of the purpose of our fear journey that we always talk with our guests about is, you know, is looking back to when we really were afraid and, you know, going through the process of how we've managed to overcome that fear. Back to your early coaster riding days, or it may have even been later on in your riding experience, what is the scariest coaster you've been on? I would love to say, since I am in charge of coasters for a living, that I've never never had a fear of coasters, but I'd be remiss if I said that. Um, the one that really comes to mind for me was opening year for Fiesta Texas. My mom brought me out to ride the original Rattler back when it had 166-foot okay. drop. Um, very intense. And... You know, my mom brought me out to ride that and I was scared to death. It was, it was tall. It was mean. It was menacing looking. It, you know, I had a reputation for being a brand new coaster. I had a reputation and I cried and cried and I, I did not want to ride it. I okay. didn't want to deal with it. Uh, my mom brought my best friend with me, her mother, and my mom made me ride this coaster and I wanted nothing. to do. And, you know, you're talking about, when you said the original Rattler, I went to Fiesta, Texas for the first time last July. And I'll tell you what, the revamped version that I've ridden, Iron Rattler, wow. <laughs> that is the most unique RMC. I've been on 13. It's the most unique RMC I've been on anywhere. It's a fantastic coaster. Amazing. I've never seen a drop like that. And the way the quarry wall is incorporated into that ride, it's second to none. That's just not something you see anywhere, period. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a ton of fun. Now, for me, I'm at the point now where I didn't look at it. It was scary. 
I was just very, very excited. And we went at a great time. We were able to get all the coasters in the park and there was no line for Iron Rattler. So they just let us ride <laughs> over and over again and switch out rows. It was fantastic. The locals take advantage of the single rider line. So mm-hmm. my girlfriend, Chelsea, she's always in that single rider line, just ride over and over and over. So you know, for those for those listening that are visiting, take advantage of the single rider line because that's going to be your accident. Good to know. And I'm definitely going to be back at some point. I was very bittersweet. I was about two weeks early for the opening of Dr. Diabolicals. <laughs> and now, see, there's another single rail family racing coaster going in, which I'm really excited about that. So I, th- I think I'm going to hold off until that's ready. And I know Cotaland has got some development going on down there as well. Once everything is open and fully operational, I'm really excited to returning to that area. But I have to say, Fiesta, Texas is at the top of the list. Yeah, yeah there's great. a lot to look forward to in, in South Texas and, and these nests and coasters. A lot yes, it's definitely one of the roller coaster development capitals of America right now. Whole lot of good stuff going on down there. So going back to that original ride on Rattler, I know you said you were scared. How did you handle it? What was it like when you were approaching the station? I, I was definitely in tears. I, I was crying. It was emotional. I just I wanted no part of it. Um, my mom kept trying to talk me into it. And it's mm-hmm. the same thing I go through with my son right now. He's 10 years old and he has that same fear of roller coasters. And um, it's difficult, but I got to think back to, to where I was at his age. And mm-hmm. um, it was a little different back then. Ride operators won't send you if you're crying and upset now. They'll pull yeah. you off for safety. Uh, but back then they sent you. So my mom put me in that seat, told me it'd be all right. Um, tried to hush me up and, He's like, you'll love it. You'll love it. Just, just ride. And I was looking at the ride operators, crying, emotional. Uh, they sent it anyway. So we're off. So my question is, did it work? How did you feel when you got off the ride? I didn't like it. <laughs> okay. I, uh, I, at that point in my life, I, I wrote it. And I, I did get to experience it a few more times. Um, but I hadn't yet quite established my love for roller coasters and, and um, especially for Rattler. Okay. Uh, still a little intense for, for that age. I would definitely agree if the intensity of the original Rattler is even remotely comparable to Iron Rattler. There was no way <laughs> at a young age I would have been prepared for that. It, it was a lot. It was, it was definitely a lot. Um, you know, I, I see a, I see a lot of, of kids at that age that are enjoying roller coasters, tense roller coasters. Mm-hmm. Um, but everybody's different. Every, yeah. every person is different. So, you know, for some, you know, that, that development, that love for coasters, you know, maybe isn't that age. For some, it is. Uh, for me, nine years old, it, it was not. Yeah. My well, mom still put me on a few more times. I grew up, too, where, like, I don't know. I was just visually fascinated with coasters. I was just drawn to them. You know, what they look like. The capabilities of what those things were able to do. But I also had my entire family... I'm the youngest of three sisters telling me how scary they were. You know, it's how scary. It's too scary. And before I'd even really gotten to ride very much because they would let me, I, I was afraid. And I realized now it was, but yet, I don't know. Visually, I was just, I just felt drawn to them. I was afraid because of what I'd been told. <laughs> You know, once I finally started writing, 
and got my nerves up enough to be able to open my eyes after years of riding with my eyes closed, my response was, you've been living a lie. <laughs> you know? This is a ton of fun, but it took a long time for it to really become fun for me. But I was old enough when I really started to do it that I wanted to keep writing until it became enjoyable. It's like it was exciting, but I was scared. You know, so I just want I just wanted to keep trying it until it got easier for me. Now, okay, you hated <laughs> the first ride on Rattler. Mom's coercing didn't work. Would you say after you got off of that coaster that you noticed any life impacts immediately or did that happen later on for you? Yeah, for me, I had grown up around being taken to amusement parks, but it, it was a treat. You know, my family um, definitely was not well off. We, you know, we would make ends meet. So, you know, going to parks was a treat. It wasn't something that we typically had annual passes to. It was something my mom would, to be honest, coupon or, you know, go after for sale or something like that. So Me too. Yes. Did it. And we would picnic in the park or in the parking lot. We would, mm -hmm. we, you know, we weren't spending money on food and drink in the park. And uh, we, were, we were very frugal. Um, I was able to experience some of the stuff, but just probably not the frequency that you know, maybe others would. I mean, just the annual passes was not in our, not in our uh, things we could afford. Um, but I, you know, looking back on that, you know, if my mom hadn't have done that and had, had me face my fear, and even though I continued to have fears at that age, um, I would have never rode Rattler in its original state. And, you know, that's something very special to me now. Um, so that, that, I'm glad she made me face my fears at that point because, you know, I wouldn't have that. I wouldn't have that, those special memories, you know, with her. Um, and on rides that, you know, are, are def defunct at this point. Yep. And it's one of those things I know we were discussing a little bit earlier for me. The impacts for me have really been something that have just randomly presented themselves in the moment of situations that are not even remotely connected to coasters. You know, like the whole weight loss thing. Fears in your head. Overratings in your head. Yep. And, and I shared with you previously, I used to be very introverted. All of a sudden, there's a situation where I need to be assertive. And instead of holding my head down at the floor, you know, letting somebody walk all over me, I'm confident. I'm able to say what I mean and mean what I say. And I also used to be really codependent, you know, would just do and do and do for everybody and never really make my needs known or take the time to take care of myself. Now I've, I've learned to use the word no. I use the word no as needed. And, you know, because it, it's, I've, I've told people a hundred times, you cannot pour from an empty cup. If you don't do what you need to do to take care of yourself mentally, and for me physically too, if I'm not taking care of myself physically, I can't go to the parks and do what I love doing. And if I'm not taking care of myself mentally, I'm no good across the board for anybody, anywhere, at any time. So it's just those, those effects that it's had on me. And it's just been random situations at random times. And I sit down and I think about it. I'm like, how in the world was I able to actually be assertive with that confrontational person and handle that situation and not be scared? Where's all that fear that used to well up in me? Goes back to coasters. <laughs> That's what our podcast is about, is coaster therapy for sure. 
So I told you I had a story I was going to share with you earlier. And that, that'll, that'll come after this next question. It's pretty entertaining, at least I think it is. You're not only, you know, a park representative, you're an enthusiast. And for me, the most enjoyable part of this hobby that I now refer to as this crazy life of mine are the unexpected moments that happen and you weren't planning on. And <laughs> that can be taken a number of different ways, depending on the situation, you know, whether it's more shocking or it's something that's funny. Looking back on your experience in amusement parks on coasters, if you had to pick, I guess, like the most unexpected, craziest, most random moment ever, what would that be? Um, probably when I was 18 years old, I was the ride supervisor of the Roadrunner Express roller coaster. And part of those duties in the morning uh, is working with the team to go through the inspection process and, and get the, the roller coasters up and ready for operation and getting them ready for our guests that are coming in. Um, but part of that includes um, test riding the coasters. So um, get to be the first riders of the day. And um, this happens on all all the roller coaster cars. So, you know, if you have two, two train operation at, at the Roadrunner, I'm riding both of the, the coasters um, before they open. Um, but on this one particular day, uh, riding the Roadrunner Express, uh, after the first drop, I was struck by a bird in the chest. Um, feathers, oh my God. feathers everywhere inside the train. Um, oh. Sadly, the, the bird, um, Bird's beak broke off in my my shirt and in my chest. Um, oh, goo no. and lots of blood. Um, I wasn't hit in the face or anything like that, but uh, definitely a uh, an experience. It's never happened to me ever again. Um, but definitely something I never forgot. Wow! <laughs> of all the people I've talked to on this podcast, that is definitely a first. The only thing I've even seen that looks like that, I think there was a picture of, who was it, Michael Bolton or somebody on a coaster? Fabio got hit in the face. Fabio, Fabio, it was Fabio. I knew it was a celebrity. Got hit in the face with a bird. Yep. I've never talked to somebody that that's actually happened to. You know, when you ride as many roller coasters as um, as we do, as we're riding them every single day, every single train, especially, you know, up and coming for me working as a ride supervisor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're riding these, these coasters in the morning, you're riding them midday, you're jumping in and riding with guests, you're riding them at the end of the night. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you're logging a lot of ride cycles on these. Um, big part of it's, you know, being part of the guest experience and, and you know, riding these with the guests. So um, when you log that many rides, you know, things like that will, will, will happen. Did that beat you up at all? Did that what? Did that beat you up at all? I was more in shock. I wasn't hurt. Uh, I had to change my shirt. It wasn't a presentable shirt to be wearing that day. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I, I would never want to harm an animal. And no, uh, it was very unfortunate. Uh, but it was very shocking experience. Uh, you know, I got back is changing my shirt, cleaning up the the coaster mm -hmm. coaster car, and um, definitely caught me off guard. Yes, I'm a huge animal lover as well. I have a house full of pets, and I, I would be the one, if that happened to me, I'd be the one standing there crying over the bird. <laughs> it, it, would, it would really upset me, but wow. My crazy story is a little different. It goes back to that credit chasing I was talking about earlier, and it, back over Labor Day weekend, it just... Jar of memory when we were talking about it. Those little portable coasters. Have you ever been to Grady's Family Fun Park in Illinois? No. They had the absolute idiotiest, bittiest little kitty coaster I've ever seen. And 
we both looked at that. My son, and I, I'm like, he's like, they're not going to let us ride that. It, we are too big. I said, well, you know me. Worst thing they can say is no. I'm going to ask. Well, he said we could ride. If it tells you anything, I'm 5'3", and I had to sit sideways. Like, with my knees <laughs> pointing sideways. And they were coming out from under the lap bar on this thing. The seat was so tiny. And they started running that thing. That put me in physically more pain than I can remember possibly ever being in a <laughs> coaster. It left bruises on my shins. And it was relentless. They took it around like 20 times. <laughs> And we were literally, I mean, just to just to make some fun out of the experience because it was so ridiculously awful. We were just screaming, ow, make it stop, like <laughs> all the way around. And that, that was, that's my craziest memory that I have in recent times. And that, what, that coaster was actually... Number 350 for me, and it's not one I'd want to go back and ride again. <laughs> we'll, go ahead and, we'll go ahead and forget 350. Yeah. <laughs> Never leave credits on the table. It's <laughs> what my friend Gene always says. So I, I go by that. I, I can ride it once. Whether or not I ride it again remains to be seen. So you said you've ridden somewhere, what, around 300 coasters? We're, we're probably just, just north of 300. Okay. So out of all of those coasters you've ridden, what is the one that's your absolute favorite that you just stands out above all the rest? My absolute favorite is um, the Schwarzkopf Thriller, which was Taz's Texas Tornado at Astroworld. That's probably the one that stands out to me over the years. That's not one I've ever gotten to experience. Can you tell me more about it? What do you love about so, it? So it's it originally started out in, at Grotto Land in, um, in Germany, moved to Astro World. Um, the Schwarzkopf four loop, the, and this is the circle loop uh, with yes, two loops that are back to back. Um, might be wrong on this, six and a half Gs. I mean, it, just, it, it was definitely... A very intense roller coaster based on yeah. its design. Um, I was able to get quite a few rides, you know, driving to, to Astro World from San Antonio. Um, my earlier ride operator days, earlier days working for Six Flags, um, that one just really stood out to me. Mm -hmm. The amount of G forces, the it was just it was unlike anything else in that that ride and that park. You know, having Viper and having the Schwarzkopf uh, Breeze Lightning, the Shuttle Loop really just sparked my love for Schwarzkopf uh, roller coasters, but more specifically, it has this Texas tornado. Okay. And I, you're talking about those uh, Schwarzkopf's and, and I'll tell you, there was one down in Texas name of it's on the tip of my tongue. I rode last year. Shockwave. Yes. Yeah, Shockwave. Okay. Yep. Keep in mind, I am an adrenaline chaser. I mean, Intimidator 305, I showed up at King's Dominion last year, rode it 32 times. That's 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 me. I'll, Iron Gwazi, if, there, if it's possible to go beyond number one, that's my number zero. I will ride literally all day. I will chase a coaster that gives a good gray out. I, I like that. It's fun. But Shockwave... Those Schwarzkopf's do not play around. They do not. We're talking about those G's. The thing nearly blacked me out. And I had to take a little break <laughs> after that. They are intense. And I looked at it and I really wasn't expecting that much. I could not believe the punch that that thing packed. 
of course, my son and his friend wanted to go ride and get it. I'm like, you go ahead. I'll be there <laughs> in a few minutes. I got to recover a little bit first, but I've never been that close to a full blown blackout going through the inversions. That thing was insane. They're definitely special. And every time a short cough closes, uh, it's mm -hmm. difficult. So, um, you know, get your rides in, you know, definitely visit, you know, for those listening, visit the parks that still have them. Yeah. Um, just, it's, it's amazing how smooth they run and how intense they are, mm -hmm. um, but especially how smooth they are for their age. It's, it's unlike anything else. Yeah, I know there's a, the new one that's getting ready to open up at Indiana Beach. Yep. And um, I still call it Camaro, but I don't, I don't know the new name. I can't remember the new name of it off the top of my head, but it looks like they have literally reinvented that thing Yeah. from the inside out. And I'm definitely excited to experience it. I can't wait either. Yeah. I'll be there. Us too. It's about a four hour drive for me. We typically go to Indiana Beach a couple times a year. And that's just given us an extra special reason to return again this year. So we've talked about your favorite coaster, which too is a first on our podcast, which I think is great. You know, Schwarzkopf's, that's not a manufacturer that a lot of people bring up. It's just not one that's really been discussed, at least not with the guests that I've interviewed. With that being your favorite coaster, looking at all the coasters you've ridden, what is the one or some of the coasters that you've ridden and you just didn't learn to love them or even like them for that matter. Like you wrote it once. It's something you absolutely just don't like and you wouldn't want to ride it again. One specifically would be um, the Big Apple coaster before the modification. I was done with that coaster. I rode it on a trip to Las Vegas, um, rode it once, never had the desire to ride it ever again. It was um, that was a Togo that I I was done with after the, the first ride. So Chelsea, Chelsea drug me back out there um, mm -hmm. earlier this year and uh, and put me on it. And it was a completely different ride. It was much smoother. It was definitely really? a pleasant surprise. Uh, but always, that ride had always to that point been the ride that I, the coaster that I would never want to ride again. Um, if I had to pick a type of coaster, um, Bacoma SLCs that are unmodified. Now, the yes, example, yes. I, I can do without those. Um, I when I'm at too. a park, I, I, I like to, I like my credits. Um, mm -hmm. That's one. I, it 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 takes me a second to think about that one. Um, yeah. Whether I whether or not I should uh, subject myself to that. I uh, usually take prescription strength Motrin. Now, now we're before getting on them. <laughs> Break myself. My you know, there. I haven't had the chance to go out to Maury's Piers and ride theirs. Um, they have mm -hmm. the, the modified track and the modified train, you know, but I've heard great things. So, you know, the mm -hmm. ones that have received the modification, I, I've heard are, you know, much different, much smoother. Yes. And so I look forward to that. But, you know, my experiences have been on the ones that are not modified and they have not been great experiences. So those don't sit at the top of my list. They're at the very bottom. It's understandable. I know you were. You, so the Big Apple one, that was a stand up, right? I uh, know it's sit down. Oh, it's a sit down because I've not ridden that one before. What was it about it that you didn't like? Was it just painful? It was painful. Uh, the restraints. I mean, the, just the the overall ride experience was just it, it was it was pretty awful. Um, I had warned my girlfriend over and over again, didn't want to ride this. I don't recommend it. Um, but was pleasantly surprised on this on this ride, this recent ride this year. So. Okay. So they, what was they, different they, about it this year? They they've done some modifications. Um, it I don't know all the details to it, but it, it was definitely a, a much different ride. Mm, that's good. I that's believe, always I believe it's new trains on it. And I'm really excited to try to get to experience some of the newly modified SLCs because I'm one too. I I, I I hate to hate a coaster. 
I really do. And I'm one too that's all about rider form. If I can adjust how I'm riding and learn how to ride it, you know, and learn how to enjoy it, I'll do whatever it takes, you know, to figure the ride out and, you know, make it enjoyable. And for the ones that just, I can't, it's frustrating <laughs> for me because I want to be able to enjoy every coaster. I'm just not there yet. But, you know, so I'm, I'm really hoping to get, to get to experience some of the SLCs with the modifications in the near future and learn to like those more than I do. Because right now I've not written one that I could say I actually enjoyed. It's nice that these manufacturers are coming back and reworking these, putting love back into them. You know, yes. our, our boomerang runs really well. And we're currently in the process of, of upgrades to ours. We have two new trains, not, not running at the same time, but we have two trains. So that mm -hmm. way we can keep one in rehab. Um, so we can swap them out and reduce downtime. But we have two new trains for ours and um, we're going through a complete modification on ours. So, you know, we took a ride that is well loved at the park and um, has operated and done well for us and hopefully made some, some modifications and make it even better. So we're looking forward to it. Yeah. I actually had heard something about that when I talked to Jeffrey and that's another reason all the more I want to return to Fiesta, Texas. I can ride boomerangs, but I honestly prefer not to unless I've got a reason to. So, I mean, it's definitely sounds like with the newer restraints, everything redesigned, it'll be a much more enjoyable experience. I did get to ride the one with the new restraints at Hershey Park. Valley Rancher. Yeah. yeah. And it was fun. Yep. That'll be ours. It was, it was actually fun. And I got off of that and I'm like, I th never thought I would live to see the day where I said, Hey, I want to go ride that again. <laughs> so that's definitely exciting that more parks are doing that. And I hope to see more continue to do it in the future. Definitely. It, ours is opening at the, roughly the end of the month. So look forward oh, okay. to the listeners coming out and enjoying the, the newly updated boomerang. Okay, so now I would like to kind of go on a different path. And let's talk about your history, not just with riding coasters, but as an enthusiast. I know you said you started riding coasters when you were young, but it definitely sounded like you had anything but a love for coasters early on. Please share with us the story of how you became an enthusiast and what coaster specifically made you realize. So fast forward to 16 year old me, um, okay. Six Flags and SeaWorld. Actually, I live in between both, both parks. So in, in high school, Six Flags and SeaWorld did heavy recruiting at, at the high schools around the park. So both were visiting my high school recruiting um so i had an important decision to make i knew i wanted to work at a at a theme park um it was an opportunity to be able to go to go to um, theme parks more often because uh, part of the perk of working there is you get admission um so i was really excited at the fact that i could start going to a theme park more um you know than i had in the past um speaking about you know us being a special treat when we got to go so I get to go um, a lot more frequently and um, and work at at a theme park. So fast forward to 16 year old me, um, I interviewed and got hired at Six Flags. I chose Six Flags um, with the idea that I wanted to work the Rattler. So you, know, you were talking <laughs> about facing fears earlier. I knew I wanted to work the Rattler. I wanted to work the controls. I wanted to operate that ride. Um, I was focused. That, that's what I wanted to do. Um, so I completed the interview. They hired me. They, they made the job offer. I was excited. I walked downstairs where the rides team uh, welcomed myself and other hires to the department, asked where I wanted to work. And I said, I want to work on the Rattler. And they said, we just filled that location. That's not somewhere you can work. Oh, um, so I was a little devastated. And I said, um, I, I don't know what other roller coasters you have. So I'm like, what's the next best roller coaster? And they said, the Joker's Revenge. I said, 
it's a, it's a Vacoma hurricane. Uh, I said, sign me up. So um, I tried to align myself back with the Rattler. Um, didn't work out, at least at that moment. Um, and uh, I became a ride operator. Um, you asked what made me really become an enthusiast. Mm -hmm. Working at, at Six Flags, I was aligned with a lot of other like-minded people, uh, people that um, liked ride operation. Uh, when I was in the interview, all of my friends went to games. They were like, why aren't you joining us in games? And I was like, no, no, no. I, I want to, I want to run a ride. I want to press the buttons. Like I want to be, mm -hmm. I want to be involved in, in making these big, you know, big toys work. Um, so I, I was aligned with like-minded people. Uh, we spent, you know, our, our days off going to driving to Astro World and going to the, you know, Six Flags over Texas and, and going to Sea World and, um, that's, that's where I guess my love was really jump started was aligning myself with the right people, uh, people that, that thought like me. And I would say exposure to ACE uh, at that age. Um, you know, a lot of those enthusiasts uh, held their annual events at the park. And, um, you know, I, I saw their love and passion for, for coasters. And I always wanted to work those events. I, I was always the first to sign up to work the ACE events. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I look forward to those every single year. Even though I wasn't attending, I, you know, I was, I was running the rides for them, running the coasters, um, you know, seeing their passion and their love and working with like-minded people that that's really what did it for me. That is so fascinating because, you know, literally just about every other guest I've asked that question to myself included when I answered that question, it was a coaster that made them enthusiasts. You know, I shared with you earlier, my, Right, the term into an enthusiast was dying back. You're the first person that's actually said, you know, it was more, you know, the people that brought you into this. And that's one of the things I can say as an enthusiast that's been the biggest reward to me, uh, you know, from being in the hobby is the positive energy that you get from the circle you build in the coaster community. I mean, it's just contagious and it keeps growing. It rubs off on you in a way that just, it keeps growing. And for me, you know, every time I think, okay, circle's gotten as big as it's gonna get, I, I'm not gonna meet anybody else. Lo and behold, there's always more that find a special role in my life. And I mean, it's, it's very rewarding. And I'm one of these people, I can go both ways. I can show up at a park by myself or, you know, just with my kid or whatever and have, have a good time. Those will, those will be the days we'll go marathon. But when I go to the events with the community and see my friends, you know, See, funny, I haven't seen it an entire year, and it's like you haven't even missed five minutes. You pick right up where you left back off. There's nothing like that. That's what made me look forward to the annual events that were were held at the park. Because mm -hmm. these, you know, it was the coaster talk, the the love for yeah. coasters, the 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 time that was spent with, you know, the individuals that attended those events. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I look back on it; these are friendships I made you know, 24 years ago and people I still look forward to, to seeing today and enthusiasts that visited me when I left Six Flags, you know, they visited me at my new park. So um, it, it's definitely special. Yeah. It's people first, coaster second, because without the people making it as much fun as it's become, I wouldn't have, I think the, the deep love for coasters that I do, they kind of go hand in hand. I agree. So now I'd like to switch gears again. We just kind of we talked about your story, how you became an enthusiast in your history of riding coasters. Now I would like to focus more on your amusement park experience. Because I know you said that started very early at the age of 16. Tell us about your history in the industry of amusement parks what are the specific parks you've worked at 
what roles have you had at those parks? Definitely. So I, I started in January of 99, uh, working for Six Flags. Um, I shared that I wanted to be a ride operator and I was focused on, on becoming a ride operator. And, and I did, um, I worked from 99 to, um, 2009 in ride operations. Um, so specifically, ride operations. yep, definitely. Um, working around the rides I, in 2006, I moved up into a full-time position where I was overseeing the rides department. Um, but roughly about 10 years of just being around all things ride operations. Um, in 2009, summer of 2009, um, I was approached by my boss who said, Hey, you've been doing this for a while. You, you've been around ride operations. Um, what's next? You know, what, what do you want to do next? And, uh, I was taken back. I, I, I wanted, I was a coaster enthusiast. I wanted to do rides. Um, I didn't want to do anything else. And he said, Hey, I, I think it's time that you look at doing something else. So I said, I guess if I have to do something else, I'll water park. I was like a wet version of rides. Um, so I didn't want to leave rides, but, um, I didn't think anything would come of it. And, uh, about a month later he said, Hey, you know, pack your bags or heading to heading to run our water park. Um, I, I'd never lifeguarded a day in my life. You know, I had definitely a lot of, you know, I had a lot of experience in ride operations and, you know, that would translate to operating the slides uh, in the water park, but um, never lifeguarded before. And that's a big component in running a water park is, is aquatic safety. Um, so I was moved over there. I, I was able to, to learn for about a year and a half, become a lifeguard instructor. And, you know, I grew up doing a lot of swimming, spent a lot of time at the community pool. So I was, I was definitely very comfortable with water. So that, that wasn't anything that was difficult for me. Um, but learned from the team that was there on how to run a water park. Um, but really, I, I truly missed ride operations. And um, my boss at the time, or my prior boss from ride operations, had moved over to run uh, the Kima Boardwalk for Landry's Amusements Division. And um, he had called me up and said that he had an amusements manager position that, you know, he wanted me to join and, and oversee their ride operations and, and various other operations departments. And, um, so I went out and I visited and, and talked to, talked to the staff there and, you know, did the, the site tour and, um, decided that, that I liked the property. It was a beautiful property. Uh, I liked the, the boardwalk bullet. Uh, the really fun. Oh, yeah, it was fun. I got to ride that one last summer too. Um, you know, and I, I just, I, I really like the property. So uh, mm -hmm. I made the decision, tough decision to, to leave Six Flags. Um, it was very an emotional decision for me. Um, but I made the decision. I, I left and I, um, you know, part of the, the conversation was that they were going to be opening a new property in Galveston up here. And um, I was going to be part of the design team and the setup and you know, decision making about what attractions are going there. And, and, uh, it's been about six months working with Landry's and amusements and was able to help with, with some of the design. I never saw it through to the, to the opening of the pier, but, um, started receiving phone calls from Six Flags asking me to come back. And, um, I eventually, I eventually, you know, went back. I eventually said yes. And after saying no a few times, um, I conceded and, and went back to the Six Flags. And when I went back, I went back into ride operations. You know, that was one of the things like, hey, come back, we can put you back into rides. Um, so I, I went back, it's, it's what I love. Um, you know, I want to be around ride operations. About a year into doing that, um, the water park manager job opening came, um, came up and I transitioned into back into running the water park. Um, so I spent, about 10 years as the water park manager for Six Flags. So it just took me back, uh, you know, a long time away from ride operations, which was very difficult for me, but um, I was, I was doing really well in aquatics and was very successful in, in the aquatic side and aquatic safety. Um, so I enjoyed it and I enjoyed what I was doing. Um, and then the opportunity uh, more recently came up where Jeffrey Siebert um, moved me back into ride operations. I was a veteran op operations manager for the company. Um, again, I've been doing it for over 10 years and he's like, Hey, you're, 
you have a background in ride operations. We have this opening. Would you like to um, oversee our ride operations along with the water park, you know, maintain the water park as, as part of your area responsibility. And I told him, I was like, you know, really for me, I, I love water parks now. Um, I'm still an enthusiast. And I, I love rides, but this is what I've done for the last 10 years and what I know. And uh, I said, I would love to run both. So, you know, that opportunity came up and, and um, I spent the last year, you know, running both areas. And more recently, Jeffrey um, moved me into the director of operations role. Wow. Operation My division. goodness. Because after hearing your love of ride operations, and then you went to the water park, and then you wound up going out of the water park. I didn't see you initially wanting to go back to the water park. Now you've developed a love for that as well. And it seems like your, your current role kind of combines the best of both worlds. It really is. And um, when it comes down to it, water park, you know, slides, water coasters, they're a wet version of rides. And just like I knew from the beginning, you know, I, I'm passionate about both. And really the, the root of it is I'm, I'm passionate about um, safety and, and theme park and water park operations. And you know, that's really what both of them combine is just um, the ability to operate um, a safe operation for both of our guests. And I know you are currently the director of operations at Fiesta Texas. Yeah. I know you said you you run the water park, your override operations. What does your current position fully entail? And you know, how have the previous roles you've had helped with what you're currently doing? Yeah, definitely. So um, early in the days when I was an operations manager, I oversaw the water park and I oversaw our janitorial team. Uh, did that for a few years and then that transitioned to um, me keeping the water park, but overseeing our admissions team. Um, so even though I maintained my core department, which was water park, um, they were consistently challenging me with new departments and switching some departments out um, on me. So um, in my current role as the director of operations, I oversee ride operations, water park, admissions, and park service. So I have all of our operations departments. Um, and really for me, you know, in this role, it's working closely with all of these departments and their leaders um, to ensure safe and smooth operation. And a lot of it really is, is quality assurance. You know, I'm, I'm spending time out in the park. I'm spending time talking to our guests, and, mm -hmm. you know, in our attraction lines. I'm, you know, in our restrooms. I'm, I'm in all these locations and um, just making sure that everything is up to our high standards. You know, you, you talked about being out in the park, interacting with guests. That was one of the things about my visit to Fiesta, Texas, that really stood out to me as a park guest was the interactive nature of the park staff. And I mean, oh, it wasn't, happy. yes. And it, it wasn't just one or another they went above and beyond. And um, Jeffrey wasn't actually in the park that day, but I was trying to find him. I didn't know who you were at the time and trying to make contact with him. He wasn't there, but like there were so many people, I, they didn't know whether or not he was there that went out of their way trying to see, you know, if they could locate him. People stopped throughout the park, too, and just, you know, would ask about my experience, ask how it was going that day. The Iron Rattler staff was absolutely incredible. I mean, my son and I can show up. We'll ride 30 times in a row if you'll let us. But, I mean, they would stop. They would talk to us. I mean, it's like they were genuinely interested in us, you know, and having a good time and having a good time with us. And that's just not an experience you get at every single park that you walk into. It's just a very welcoming atmosphere. A big part of it, too, is, you know, you have Jeffrey Siebert, myself, and many others that are enthusiasts that work here. And we're traveling around other parks. We're, you know, we're, we're enjoying our time at these other parks. But we're also taking back um, best practices and things that we're seeing. And, you know, and... Um, a visit last year I had to Kings Island. I was just absolutely amazed by the ride operations and the safety mm -hmm. and efficiency and just the, the interaction that they had on the ride docks and just the uh, ride are having fun. 
Like they were just having fun, but it was an efficient, safe operation. And, you know, you best believe I'm, t- I'm taking notes and I'm, I'm bringing that stuff back here. And, um, you know, I, I think that's what's special about this park is um, the enthusiast nature and how we, we incorporate it into our operation. You know, we're, we're not always going to be the best, but we're, we're working towards, you know, making, making everything better. And we're, we're taking well, the uh, best practices and ideas and, and incorporating back into our operation. It definitely, it definitely shows in the guest experience, I'll tell you that. And speaking of Kings Island, even though I technically live in Louisville, closer mm-hmm. to Kentucky Kingdom, Kings Island's still the park that I consider to be my home park. It's where I went grew up, growing up as a kid. It's now my son does, he's going to start his second season actually at Kentucky Kingdom tomorrow as a ride operator. But as guests, we go to Kings Island more often. That's that's the place where my heart is. So even though I don't live as close to there as I do Kentucky Kingdom, I still consider it, you know, my home park. I had never been there last year. That was my, my first time visiting. I visited three times in the last year. Oh, it's uh, fantastic. My, my girlfriend's from Ohio, uh, her home okay. park. Up until moving to San Antonio. I was King's Island, so she wanted to make sure I got up there and visited and, and got to experience her her park, and um, definitely an amazing park. I She gives me a little bit of crap because years ago, I was given a choice to go to King's Island or Holiday uh, Holiday World. Oh, yeah, Holiday World, too. Right. I chose Holiday World. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> um, she couldn't believe I chose that over King's Island, but... Um, it's definitely a special park. It's, it's, it, there's a lot with that park that reminds me of Fiesta Texas and just kind of the, mm-hmm. the atmosphere. And while they're both uniquely different, um, there are things that, you know, remind me um, of Kings Island that are here. And um, they're both very, very special parks. Yeah. Holiday World, too. That's just about an hour and 15 minutes from my house. It's got my number two coaster, The Voyage. And, um, Hollywood Nights, their enthusiast event. That that's an event I live for, and I'm going to Coaster Stock next week, at Kings Island as well. But Hollywood Nights, I, I've told people a hundred times, I'm like, as long as God will bless me with a body that is physically able to marathon Tremendous Voyage, <laughs> I'm going to that event. And the people there, the energy, it's it's untouched from I guess an excitement slash adrenaline level it's just you have to experience it to get it I get plenty of rest but I kind of go into hibernation a few days before (laughs) and I plan on resting really good a few days after so that I'm able to thoroughly enjoy that event coaster stock too the hours are the coaster stock is just like a big old family reunion it's it's a very positive thing, just just in a different way, a little bit. I, I would say definitely calmer, but every bit is fun. They're both fantastic events and good park, very good parks and in different ways. Next time we're now, up there, I'll have to have you join us at Kings Island for. Oh, no, hit me up anytime. Let me know when you're coming. I will, if it's possible to show up, I'll I'll figure out a way. I'd love to join y'all. So how many years have you been at Fiesta Texas now? 24 and a half. This is my 25th season. You and I are pretty neck and neck. I'm in, I'm finishing my 24th year of teaching now, 19 years in the same school. But looking back over those 24 years, I'm sure, you know, there's been a lot fantastic things happen in the park and goodness you all are one of the most rapidly changing evolving parks that i see right now on the radar i mean there's there's always new stuff happening and can't wait to hear what's right around the corner because i'm sure it's going to be constantly a case of oh yes there's more Looking back on your tenure at Fiesta, Texas, what do you feel has been your greatest accomplishment up to this point? 
but it's not going to be coaster related. Um, okay. I, I, sure. I have one few that I that I could share that that definitely come to mind. But you know, one of the ones that I I, I feel really proud about is um, in taking over the water park operation. Um, we're graded by an outside agency, uh, Ellis and Associates, and um, they come in and they do unannounced audits, safety audits for us. And um, you don't know they're coming, and they <laughs> they observe your your aquatic staff and they they open up your books and they look at all your paperwork and make sure everything's in order. And um, they grade you on this. And um, it's not easy to have someone come in. You know, you think like bank teller, like someone comes in and audits the books and audits the money. Um, you know, that's what they, they do. And it's, it's not easy, um, you know, for when someone who is uh, very knowledgeable in the industry is coming in and they're, they're critiquing the, the operation. And um, they have awards for, for, you know, how well you do on, on said audits. And mm -hmm. uh, one of those is, is a platinum award and only the top 10% of the water parks in the world receive this platinum award. And um, you got to do really well um, consistently on your paperwork, your, your lifeguard observations, your lifeguard um, simulations. And uh, we've consistently received the platinum award every single year since 2014. Um, and that that's not been easy. And we're right on the cusp of, you know, going 10 years of that. And it, it's something I'm really, really proud of. And the way it transitions back to coasters and rides is just really um, myself and my, my staff. I mean, my staff's the one going out and, and they're doing this day in and day out, but it's the love and the dedication to making sure that we provide the utmost safe, you know, operation um, for our guests. You know, I've, I've always said, if I wouldn't put my my family and my friends on the ride or in the pool or on the slide, you know, I'm not going to put our guests. So, you know, when I'm when I'm inspecting and I'm going through um, preparing our attractions for for operation, that's what's going through my mind is, um, you know, would I put my family and my friends and my loved ones on on these attractions? And if I wouldn't, they're not going to open. And um, again, the, the level of, of passion towards you know safety. Um, here amongst the staff is is unlike anything else. They they are all very passionate about keeping our guests safe. Well, and I mean, what you said there really hit the nail on my on the head. From my experience there as a guest, the staff treats you, you treat them like I mean, you may treat you like family. That's the vibe that I got all the way throughout the park and I never really thought about it like that until you said that but I, I really think that that is part of why I see Fiesta Texas becoming more and more of a destination park you know not just for enthusiasts but you will reach out across the board there's something there for everybody, the young, the old, whether you ride coasters, whether you don't, you know, whether you're there for the shows, whether you just want to enjoy being in the park. There's something there for everyone and you are made to feel like they want you to be there. Definitely. And the employees present themselves in a way that shows they actually want to be there. It's more than a job. They love it. And that transpires straight across to everybody that comes into contact with them. So I know a lot of our audience listens for, you know, different, different types of reasons, inspiration, advice, help. And, you know, a lot of people listen as enthusiasts, like trying to find their way into the amusement park industry, potentially as a career and that sort of thing as well. What types of experiences did you have outside of the parks or even, I guess, somehow connected to the parks as far as education that you received that helped you succeed in the role that you have currently at Fiesta Texas? So on the, on the education side, 
I received my associate's degree and I got right up to the cusp of getting my bachelor's degree and really just became encom- encompassed with just working a- as much as possible. So I, I never finished my bachelor's degree, uh, but that mm-hmm. really hasn't set me, set me back on, you know, getting where I, where I am, you know, in the industry. Um, you know, for me, it just turned into a focus on work. I, I knew, you know, at that point when I had finished my associates that I, I really wanted to, to do this as a career. I want to do it in a full-time uh, capacity. I was early into the full-time capacity. Um, you know, it, a big part of it is, you know, for someone that's looking to make a career out of this is, I would say, aligning yourself with um, certifications that you can receive. So, you know, early okay. on, as, you know, like a ride operator or someone that's working in, you know, park operations or aquatics, you know, learn as much as you possibly can. You know, be open to learning more. Um, you know, I would say anytime someone is lobbing out, you know, get trained on this or learn this at Fraxton or, you know, you're a ride operator and they're asking you to go help out and learn in admissions or help out and learn in culinary or whatever, whatever. Take every mm-hmm. opportunity to learn that comes your way. Okay. Um, you never know. If I hadn't have said yes to my boss when he said, what's next? And I said, water park. And he said, all right, pack your bags. I would have never been the water park manager. I wouldn't have had that experience. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, what I would share to the listeners is take those opportunities when they present themselves. Even if it's something small, you're learning something that maybe you don't, you don't see what the future is going to be with that. Maybe someone's saying, I'm going to train you on this piece of equipment. You know, I'm going to teach you how to operate a forklift or, you know, whatever it may be, take those opportunities and, and learn. You may not be able to connect it at that point, but down the road, you will be able to. Um, and, you know, I, I would say with hard work, um, it's going to present opportunities to um, go to events that you could receive certification. You know, for me, I was able to go out and become a lifeguard instructor. I got certification in becoming a rides trainer. Um, I received maintenance certifications, which, you know, I, I don't work in the maintenance division, but it's important that I, you know, understand the maintenance side of things and to be able to talk the talk and, 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 you know, know what I'm looking at and, um, so I would say take those opportunities as they present themselves, even if you're not connecting those dots immediately. Um, you're blank. Um, yeah, that, that would probably be the, the big thing that I would share is just continue to take those opportunities that present themselves. Okay. Well, and it sounds like definitely the place to be on the job training whole lot work your way up and the sky's the limit as long as you're willing to work hard it definitely the hard work is is important um you know being open um availability yeah. wise you know i was always the first to sign up for the shifts that nobody wanted you know the the overnight right. shifts uh when we had you know project graduations or things like that um you know just continue to to show that you're uh, hardworking and dedicated. And I, I think people notice, you know, I, I definitely think people notice, um, you know, and um, that'll, that'll go a long way. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I'm sure that has inspired um, some of our younger listeners that may, you know, really just not have an idea how to get started getting into the industry. That advice was very helpful. So I appreciate it. The other thing I would share real quick, sorry. Uh, You're fine. Go there, right ahead. There are industry-related events uh, like IAPA, uh, WWA, World Water Park Association, and they're always looking for volunteers. So, um, you know, putting yourself out there to volunteer at these is a great networking opportunity and take advantage if you're put in, you know, put in those situations. So um, if you go on their websites, there, there's opportunities to sign up to volunteer. Um, okay. And I, I would share, you know, if you're up and coming or, you know, wanting to get in the industry, connect on LinkedIn. You know, LinkedIn's all about um, connecting. You don't have to know the person to connect with them. I mean, that, that's really, that's what makes the magic of LinkedIn is um, connect with these people so they can, you can communicate with them. You can see what's going on with them. They can see what's going on with you. Um, but continue to put yourself out there for uh, industry related stuff. And, you know, I think that'll also open doors. All right. So we've talked a lot now about your history at amusement parks, your education 
and um, you know, kind of the different experiences you've had that have led you up to where you are now. Looking back over the last 24 years into your current role in 2023, I talked about, you know, the impact that your staff left on me during my visit to the park. I'd like you to share with our audience two things, if you will. What impacts have working in the amusement park industry had on your life? And what impacts do you strive to have on staff and guests at the end of the day? Like, you know, when guests leave, what's the one takeaway you'd like them to have? And, you know, staff, whether they leave for the day or, you know, whether that's the end of their tenure at Fiesta, Texas, when they're leaving, you know, what kind of impacts would you like to have that's lasting for them? I'll start with the, the question about me. Um, okay. The industry, the impact the industry's had on me, um, at least more recently, uh, my, the love of my life is an enthusiast and has really reinvigorated my love and, you know, for being an enthusiast of the, of the industry. Um, she was a guest in the park and was visiting Fiesta, Texas for the first time in 2019. And, um, we actually met in front of Batman the Ride at Fiesta, Texas. Um, Brandon from Theme Park Predictions yes. uh, texted me and said, as well. I know this nice girl. She's an enthusiast. Um, can you meet up with her and, you know, answer any questions she has or kind of tell her about the park and, you know, make sure that she has a good day. It's her first visit at your park. And um, so I met up with her and I, um, I talked to her and her friend and, um, that our relationship would have never blossomed. We, we didn't start dating till a year after that. Mm -hmm. uh, we stayed through COVID. We stayed um, good friends and communicated via text message and via phone. Um, we went to, she visited one more time um, during the summer of COVID and we went to SeaWorld together as friends. Um, but I wouldn't have that relationship with her if I hadn't met her at, at Fiesta, Texas. So um, that, that's very special to me. Um, as for the staff at Fiesta Texas, um, for me, the biggest part is just giving back regardless of career paths. I know and I've learned over the years that most people aren't gonna stay in this industry. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, this is a job while they're going to school or a job, um, you know, to the paycheck. And um, not everybody's as enthusiastic about, you know, roller coasters and theme parks as myself or others. Um, and that, that's that's totally fine. Um, but I want to make sure that their employment experience and the time that they're here is memorable for them. Um, so big thing for me is just aligning their skill sets and um, maybe what they're going to school for with things that we have here. Um, we're a mini city. Uh, theme parks are a mini city. So there, there's just so many facets to our operation. And, you know, if someone's going to school for photography, aligning them with maybe our marketing team and making sure that they're getting, um, even if they're in like right operations, that they're getting some relevant experience that they can put on their resume. So when they graduate, um, they have some relevant experience that they can and talk through in interviews, uh, relevant experience um, that they can, they can take to secure that job. Uh, big, big question for me when I'm talking to people in interviews, um, you know, applicants that are coming in is, um, you know, what do you bring to the table and what can we do for you during your tenure? Um, I want to know like what, what can we do? Uh, this isn't one-sided. This employment is not one-sided. It never is. Um, I want them to take away just as much as, you know, as we're gaining, you know, their interactions out with our guests, the efficiency and safety they're putting out, you know, it, it's not one-sided. It, it's got to be, got to be two-way street. So mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure that they're getting the most out of their employment experience. And that, that's always been very important to me. Um, and, and for our guests, uh, it's not our current mantra for Six Flags, but it's, it's lived with me since I started working with Six Flags and um, to create family fun and fond memories. I have fond memories of going to Six Flags over Texas. So I have a fond memory of going to Six Flags over Texas as a child. 
um, is very special. And I have, you know, family members in these pictures that are no longer with me and um, me holding a big stuffed animal and, you know, me riding the log ride and um, somebody in my family took these pictures and um, I have memories of it. And I have these, these wonderful pictures. Um, I was able to share them recently on my, my Facebook um, you know, talking about my, the start of my 25th year working for Six Flags and just kind of reminiscing on my childhood visit to Six Flags over Texas. And, um, you know, I, for me, making sure that the, the guests that are coming out to our park are having those, those same memories are, um, they may not all be enthusiasts, um, but make sure they have those that release from, from the daily, uh, for their daily life and that they're able to come out and have a good time and have those great memories with their family, their friends, their loved ones. Um, our job is to create fun. Okay? Uh, we Jeffrey Siebert would say, he, he says it frequently, we work so others can play. Um, yes. We're asking about working so others can play. Um, it, it's, it's a very special line of work. And um, that's what I enjoy the most. So even though it's not our monster anymore, you know, I'm all about creating family fun and fond memories. And, making sure that, you know, we're delivering that out there. And it, it's not just on the ride docks. Um, it, it's the passion that we take in cleaning restrooms. It's the, the greeting at the, the toll plaza or the main gate when you're coming in. It's um, quickly resolving your issue if an issue arises at our guest relations. It, it's all these components that go into it. And, um, you know, that starts with our staff really enjoying their job. And if they're not enjoying their job, they're not going to deliver this. So, um, giving back and making sure that they're having fun while they're working um, is a top priority. Thank you so much for putting so much thought and detail into that response. And, you know, to kind of flip flop and reverse what you said, I heard you mention this earlier, something you and Jeffrey both mentioned is you like to go play when you're not working. <laughs> And, um, you know, visiting other parks, getting those, other, you know, getting those other ideas, you know, even for me and my profession is teaching, going and seeing what others are doing. You know, it just, it just keeps raising the bar, dangling that carrot. How can I get better? And, you know, speaking of getting better, Fiesta, Texas, that park is a really hot topic in a good way, you know, in the community. It's one of those parks. At first I heard about it every now and then, but literally people are talking about Fiesta, Texas all over the map. I mean, the radar, it's really becoming a destination park. And, you know, I see the fact, you know, that you all are going out, seeing these other parks, getting ideas, and that sort of thing. I like to think that, you know, that that may contribute to some of the rapidly occurring developments. But from your viewpoint, what do you think is making Six Flags Fiesta Texas a destination park? that not just enthusiasts, but families and people from all over the world are putting on their bucket list to come visit. I think it starts with the theming and the beautiful setting, our beautiful rock quarry, uh, the thought that's being put into our, our attractions. And even going back, you think poltergeist, going back and, and working um, a more solid theming into uh, that attraction. We're the things that we're doing now and the level we're taking things, I think is really where we we're setting that bar. Um, the Southern hospitality I talked about earlier, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and really just putting in thrilling rides and coasters. Um, you know, I think that's, that's where, that's where it begins. That's what's putting us on the radar. You look at the, the innovation that has gone in with prototypes and, you know, Batman, the ride, the first 40, um, Wonder Woman, um, the first single rail RMC, um, you know, innovating is really where it started. And we're blessed. This this started out as a 
amazing show park, just beautiful show park. Um, so we had, we had a canvas that really started with propelling us towards this success. Uh, just the other part was coming in with the rides and, and, and starting to, to fill in the rides and fill in the theming. And um, I think that's really what makes us the destination park. You know, I can really say that, you know, when we came to visit, of course, my son and I were those, were those people that'll ride coasters all day. But <laughs> we wanted to experience other parks as other parts of the park as well. My daughter, she's a little bit different. She'll ride coasters for a while, but then she's more of what I would call an amusement park enthusiast per se, and not just there to ride a coaster, you know, 20, 30 times. One of her most favorite experiences was the beauty of the park, looking at the waterfall, you know, just sitting there submerging herself in that setting. And, you know, and I agree with you totally. Just what, what, when you walk into that park, I don't care who you are. I don't care what your interest is. You're, you're going to find something there for you. That's going to make you want to keep returning. You all are doing an absolutely outstanding job. <laughs> Thank you. And, you know, one of the hot topics, too, with enthusiasts, as you know, is, you know, building these record-breaking coasters and stuff. But on the flip side, one of the things I tell people, you've got to keep the future coming in the door, too. Yep. you got to have something there for everybody because the majority of the people coming into the park are not enthusiasts. You got you know, your families, your kids, what's there for them. And this new single rail family racing coaster that you all have coming in sounds like it's really going to hit the mark on that. For us, that installation this year and adding the, the kids' water slides, which mm -hmm. that idea came from visiting Holiday World many years ago with my son. Wow. And he spent the whole time at the, you know, the children's water slide section. And I came back and said, we need these. We need these. I've been bugging mm -hmm. everyone ever since. Yeah. Um, but these were two needed additions. You know, this, the single rail, um, the dueling single rail may not be the highest on everybody's list that's an enthusiast. But um, if you look at, at what we need, that's what, you know, these attractions, both in the hard park and water park, are what we needed. I'm really happy, too. The big kids are going to be able to ride that like me. <laughs> and you get two credits instead of one. So that's even better. <laughs> Very excited. We made okay. sure that there was distinctions between the two to, so you can have both credits. There you go. Can't wait. Now, this next question, I would like to explain the background behind the question so it doesn't catch you off guard. We had a first season guest of the podcast before I joined. His name was Dustin Listra. He was also a very big fan of the podcast. Personal friend of David's. Was also involved with Coaster Kids to a certain extent. He unexpectedly passed away last year at the age of 16. And anytime, you know, whether I know the kid or not, when I see story like that, it, it really makes you sit back and reflect. Time is oh so very precious. You really don't have as much time as you think. And you never know which day is going to be your last day. So do as much good as you can for as many people as you can. When you can, you know. And when you mess up, make it right, because you never know when you may not have the opportunity to come back and do that. So with that being said, I want you to talk to us about your legacy. How would you like your family, friends, colleagues to remember the legacy of your life? 
I'd want them to remember me as a as an innovator in the theme park and water park world. Uh, someone who dedicated his life to safety in our industry. Um, someone that gave back and, and mentored and taught our future leaders, not only in the theme park industry, but uh, outside of the theme park industry. I want my children and grandchildren to enjoy the park, parks that I've worked in um, and see what I've helped build, you know, what I've been a part of. Mm -hmm. um, these, I'm sure these attractions will outlive me. So, you know, I think that'll be special for them to see um, something that I was a part of and spent, spent my life um, building, working with this team here. Um, you know, I think the other part of it is, and I, I frequently say to Jeffrey, um, I don't like some of the decisions people have made in the past. You know, there's there's things that you may know, design things that you just say, what were they thinking? Um, mm -hmm. You know, why did they make this queue line go this way? And you know, this isn't as efficient as it could be. Um, you just you're like, what were they thinking? So, you know, the thing I like to say to to Jeffrey and our staff is. Uh, to think 10, 20 years ahead. You know, are, are these people that are going to be working here going to be saying the same thing I'm saying is what were these people thinking? Or are we really putting thought into where this park's going to be in 10 and 20 years and designing it for them and not for now? You know, the things we're doing, putting us in a position that's going to be the right decisions for later and not now. Um, I don't want to be the pain point and I don't want decisions that I've made to be the pain point of, of future leaders at this park. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we're doing design. I'm thinking, you know, where's this park going to be? You know, most people are thinking five years out, you know, what are we, what are we doing in the next five years? What, what are the new attractions? What are the exciting things? Yeah, and that, that's great. Um, but where are we at 10, 20 years from now and how can we properly design this? Because I feel like, there's times where we're tearing things back out and, you know, redoing things where we could have just done it right the first time. And I mean, especially, you know, I, I'm going to talk about myself here. I've, I've done this for a long time. Um, there's a lot of things I, I just know better. You know, I, I've, I've seen and done this. This isn't my first rodeo. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, so I just, I want to, I want to do right by the future leaders here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hopefully I'm here in 10 or 20 years. But, but maybe I'm not. And um, I just want to make sure I'm doing right by the future leaders of this of this park. Um, so it, important part of that is just thinking ahead. You know, you're talking about legacy. Um, making sure they're in a good position. You know, yes. Like, Leaving things better than how you found them. Exactly. That's the name of the game. Thank you so much for sharing for sharing that. And um said that's a first of a kind response i've really enjoyed this interview because you definitely have a perspective on many th different things that we've discussed that's unique and with as many of my interviews as our listeners have listened to i think they're in for a real treat when they hear this because they're going to hear so many different viewpoints on things that they haven't heard before and hopefully find some inspiration along the way. I hope so. Now, speaking of our fans, you know, the podcast, that's what this is for. It's for our listeners. They listen for advice, help, inspiration, entertainment. I mean, who doesn't love good amusement park and coaster talk in our community? But, you know, one of the things I have found that people reach out to me for the most is advice. And here lately, the main advice people have been coming to me for is motivation and inspiration for weight loss. You know, that's my thing. That's what that's what people want to come to me for. On the topic of advice. And this can be literally regarding anything, you know, coaster and amusement park related or not. If you could give one piece of advice to our listeners, what is that advice that you would like to offer? I know you mentioned it earlier, Kim, about volunteering. So probably the biggest thing I, I would want to share is just give back by teaching and volunteering. and 
Um, that's been a real hot topic for me um, as I getting further along in my career. And, you know, as you're climbing the ladder, you know, for me, um, I'm looking back and how can I give back to those around me? Um, yes. Nothing feels better than seeing those around you growing and succeeding. So mm -hmm. I, I've been very proud of all the successful individuals that I've been able to, to work with. And I've had the privilege to work with and learn from uh, in my years of, of working here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would, I would say big question for me is, you know, how can, how can I teach others what took me years to learn in a shorter amount of time? You know, that that's, what's important to me is, you know, it's taken me to get to the director of operations role. It's taken me 24 years. You know, how can I help others around me if they want that same, or they have that same goal, get to this point and get to this point quicker? You know, what, what did it take me 24 years to learn that they could learn in a shorter time? What are, what are the things that I can help them put, the tools I can help them put in their toolbox to be successful? And it, it's not only growing to the role I'm in, it's being successful outside of here. So um, that's really what I'm, what I'm passionate about and um, the advice I would give, because I, I think that translates to outside of this industry um it's it's the industry that you're in it's it's all about teaching and um not just teaching you know students or teaching ride operators or lifeguards um, life skills <laughs> it's life skills um there, there's so much to be taught and so much to be so much to be learned you know we're, yeah. we're learning every single day even though that we're teaching um but just giving back you said life is short and you don't know where you're standing in the line when it's your time. You could be next in line. You could be at the end of the line. Um, make the most of, of the time that you do have here and, mm -hmm. and give back and volunteer and just leave your positive footprint on, on society. Wow, I've never heard it put that way. Leave your positive footprint on society, and I love it. You know, volunteering was nothing that I had really thought about doing before I came into the coaster community and, you know, talking about impacts and, you know, just talking with you has made me think of a couple more, you know, first of all, you know, joining the podcast, it's, it's a work of the heart, you know, it's, it's a passion, it's fun. I find, you know, no matter what stress or whatever work has brought during the week, when I sit down and do what I'm doing right now, all of that just goes away. You know, I'm having a great time and it's, it's to help other people. But, you know, I know and there's no disrespect intended here, you know, but a lot of people, you know, they, they want those YouTube subscribers to go up that, you know, they want those views to go up. You, you get the money from it. And speaking of money, you know, as far as my fitness, I actually had a company and I'm not going to name this company because it was false advertising they contacted me and wanted me to be one of their online coaches and promote their company and tell the world how their company had helped me transform my life and they were going to pay me to do it and <laughs> like first of all no because i'm not going to mislead people but two i don't know if i were getting paid for it i don't know it would feel like work to me and not you know not fun and i, I want to do this to help people and if, if i if i'm getting paid to help people to me that just I don't know. It takes away from what I'm doing. Now, yes, in teaching, I help people. I've got, I've got to have an income here. But at the end of the day, helping people to me is by far the bigger reward, you know, than get than getting a paycheck. I agree. Yeah, it's it's that intrinsic motivation. And that too, as a teacher, is what I try to build in my kids, talking about those life skills. Not working for the external rewards, but for the internal rewards that will follow that are far 
more impactful on your life than any external reward could ever be. So that brings us to our last question. I'd like to discuss social media because I'm sure many of our listeners have heard this. They're excited to get to learn more about you. Where can we find you on social media if our audience would like to connect with you and, you know, learn more about Josh Parrish or the man? Uh, I don't have a lot of social media. Well, I don't think I have a lot. I'm behind the times, I guess. Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, those are my primary ones. I, I don't see that. I don't, I don't know what these other ones are. I don't, I don't do it. Um, okay. You know, I, I think if you're trying to get to know me professionally and you're someone that's trying to get into the industry, LinkedIn's a really good resource. Um, I, I stay fairly active on that. Um, and I, I would recommend you know, LinkedIn to, to anyone. Um, Facebook's probably a little more intimate. Um, along with Instagram, I post a lot of pictures of, you know, my travels, but I, I post a lot of pictures of my, my son. Um, you know, it's, it's when I'm not at amusement parks, that's, a, you know, the, the biggest part of my life is, is my family. So um, it might be a little more inundated with, you know, my personal life, but, you know, if someone's trying to get to know me, that, that's definitely probably the avenue. So if, depending if they're trying to get to know me personally or professionally, you know, that would probably dictate or, you know, add me on all, all of them. <laughs> okay. Well, that is the end of our interview. And I want to thank you so much for sharing your incredible story with me and our audience. I appreciate you taking the time to be our guest, and thanks for joining us, on, joining us on the podcast. Thank you. Likewise. I, I really, my pleasure. The pleasure was all mine. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. If you want to see more of us, we upload every Friday. Be sure to like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All at Coaster Challenge. Links are in the description below. Thanks for joining us here today.